welcome to the Out of Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. OutofLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. Welcoming back to the program is a name that you've known since the very beginning of the show, and that is the astrophenom, Miss Constance Stellis, who also serves as a virtue. This is a one on one interview with her. She's going to talk about the upcoming solar eclipse. It's going to take place in the U.S. She's going to talk about all things related to astrology. I have to say that I think she's the best astrologer in the world. There's hands down. She's so sharp. She's so insightful. And it is an honor to have her be a part of the show. And it's an honor to have Miss Lisa Kaza and Miss Carrie O'Connor be a part of the program. I think our virtues are amazing. So I don't know about you, but I've been giving a lot of thought into the eclipse. And this is what I think is going to happen. When the eclipse starts, it's going to be like an ending from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where all the evil people start going, ah, you know, they start screaming, and, and all of a sudden these spirits come out and they pull them off the planet, and all that's left are just peaceful people. I'm, it's probably not going to happen, right? My other thought was that the eclipse is going to start, and all of a sudden people are going to be going, ah, and all the bald people are going to have afros. I think that's probably more likely, and that's what I'm really banking on. I don't know. But Miss Stellis is going to provide some incredible insight. She's a treasured asset of the Outer Limits of Truth Radio Show. And let us begin today's program. Her name is Miss Constance Stellis. We refer to her as the Astro Phenom. Pumped up. She's a phenomenal astrologer. She's been a virtue on the Outer Limits of Truth Radio Show since its inception in 2014. Provided a lot of great astrological analysis. We've had her on before. And you can learn more about Ms. Constance Stellis by going to her website at ConstanceStellis.com. Astro Phenom, welcome back to the Outer Limits of Energy Truth Radio. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, the most energetic uh, <laughs> introduction I've had in a long time. I'm very pleased to be be with you. Well, thank you, Ms. Uh, Stellis. There are strobe lights going on right here. Ah! Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I feel like the disco queen. <laughs> That's right. So, I'm serious. I mean, when we talk, you are so sharp and so on top of these things, and I don't think anyone ever gauges that kind of insight when it comes to astrology better than you can. So, thank you for all of the shows that you've, you've provided great, great insight on. And when we were talking before the, this show, you said that something interesting is going to be happening in August, August 2017, some event. Can you please describe what that event is and what I we can expect to happen? Can. Well, throughout the year... We have eclipses. There are usually two in a month, and uh, the last set were in February, and they're mathematically calculated. I mean, you can go to the NASA website, and the astronomers note these eclipses. Now, astronomers categorize or classify eclipses in a different way than astrologers, because our job is to interpret what phenomenon in the heavens portends means for people down here on earth an astronomer doesn't have too much truck with that they they measure the eclipses and they appreciate the beauty of them okay so that's a common common ground there are solar eclipses and there are lunar eclipses the sun or the moon and in the um uh, lunar eclipse which is when the uh, there's a new moon it means that the sun and the moon are in the same sign. In a solar eclipse, the sun is opposite the moon. Okay, everybody gets lost with that terminology. So we had, um, and I should say, that eclipses are only important for in two ways. If they fall on a major planet or any planet in your natal chart, in other words, your astrology chart when you were born, then that is a significant contact and will influence from three to six, sometimes even nine months after that, depending on how it works in your chart. And to know that, you have to have your chart calculated um, by an astrologer or study a long time so you can understand what it means. The other thing about eclipses that is very important is the path, of the uh, shadow, whether it's lunar or solar, that the eclipse uh, forms. And when I mean path, I mean in the geography of the Earth. 
And this, of course, not of course, but this is more significant with a solar eclipse because it literally creates a shadow. And you can look in ancient times when people didn't understand what was happening. This was a fearful and portentous event because all of a sudden the sky darkened. And what's going on? You know, will the sun come back? It was a a very primitive uh, fear and feeling. And what does it mean? So in August, first one on August 7th uh, is in the sign of Aquarius. Oh, Ryan, it's very close to you, as a matter of fact. Uh Uh-oh, what's going to happen? Yep, yep. No, it's okay. Um, And uh, it's actually 15 degrees of Aquarius. And um, then, August 21st, we have what is being called the Great Solar Eclipse, which is at 28 degrees of Leo. Now, Leo and Aquarius are opposite signs. So this is all mathematically calibrated. But the significance of the uh, 28 Leo Eclipse at the end of August is it's being called the Great American Eclipse solar eclipse because the path that it forms cuts through the company uh, through the country and um, shadows a a good deal of the earth there are many many countries involved and what we see with eclipses is that where the shadow falls is a hot spot or hot spots for the coming year so America is front and center it was also very interesting because there there are now two astrology charts for uh, Donald Trump. One had this eclipse falling exactly on his ascendant, uh-huh. so what is which this? is significant. <laughs> Does this mean that something crazy is going to happen? Oh, I mean, do, do well, something crazy something? has already happened. <laughs> we oh, well, I mean, what else can go? I mean, how else can they take? I mean, if it's going to fall on his chart, what does that, does that mean? Um, well, it's going to be passed, or he'll be. Maybe he'll, no, he'll be no, nice. no. It's more significant than that. Is he going to apologize and admit he was wrong about something? Dubious. Um, what? And I have to say that since this election, I have left political predictions behind, because it seems like the system is rigged. Now, astrologers are supposed to know more things than other people. However, our own blinders came into play because very few astrologers predicted what ha- would happen in the election. And it was a very clouded, and I mean in terms of Neptunian clouds, Neptune is the planet of cloudiness, how everything went down. Okay, so back to, uh, but the second chart does not have the eclipse, uh, because there's a d- discrepancy in Donald Trump's birth time. Um, Some say it's one thing, and then evidently Marla Maples uh, confided to a couple of astrologers that, in fact, it was a different birth time. So I I put that out there because it's hard to know what's true these days. (laughs) If, in fact, the eclipse falls on his ascendant, which is the rising sign, it is significant and it denotes a radical change in his uh, status. Okay, so and positive or negative, though, that he could be, he could be, but, but uh, mostly saying. negative. And I say this because not my politics that they don't come into play. But his ascendant is on a very prominent fixed star. Fixed stars are not planets, but they are significant points in the heavens that have been important for astrological observers for 5,000 years. This fixed star is called the Royal Watcher, and it denotes a kingly presence and always shows a fall from this kingship. So astrologers, myself included, thought that this would be not getting the presidency. Well, that didn't happen. And uh, so we are going to see what happens in August. And uh, I don't make the prediction that, you know, he's going to be booted out. But the climate of the White House and his presidency will definitely change. 
Okay. Well, let's see that if people are you – know, anyone, everyone else besides Donald Trump, besides mm. – uh, who have a similar astrological chart reading, like I say, within the vicinity of his birth chart – Right. What can that? We're going to spend them. What three astrological signs will be impacted? And when you say the astrological signs, can you please give the um, the, t- the t- reference as far as the oh, month goes? The time. Sure. So the first one that will be affected would be Leo. Leo begins uh, around the twenty second or twenty third of July and goes to the twenty second of August. Now, this is late degrees of Leo. All right, but we won't get too complicated. So Leos and Scorpios and Aquarians and Taurus. Why? Because those four signs are all in a connection with each other, either an opposition or a square or a conjunction. So they're also called fixed signs. Fixed signs because they're in the center of the um, season, summer, um, fall, winter, and spring. And also their characteristic is to hold tight, to hold fast. They are steady, sometimes rigid, and there's a whole other bunch of adjectives we could use. But those signs will be affected by both of the eclipses in August. So as far as being affected, do you, do you find that from maybe some – if, you, if somebody is if you're one of the signs and you're putting you're doing something work related wise, relationship related wise, can you expect a a surge of momentum? Can you expect a resistance? Can you expect a, a paralysis of progressing your energy forward? What kind of uh, likely uh, impact could you envision seeing? For some people, it will be uh, a bolt from the blue and very energizing. For other people, it will be a block and not so energizing. Something to overcome. And, you know, I, I, I hesitate to, 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 to say, well, it could be this or it could be that. But the fact is that an astrological chart is a complex energy map. And to, you know, section out this one sign, which is the position of your sun, is uh, not doing the person a good service. It's more complicated. And I hate, hate, hate people that kind of reduce everything to, oh, well, that means that you're going to have, you know, health problems. I mean, believe me, life is complicated. So, but that being said, those four signs will have either a jolt of energy or kind of a block um, for uh, after the eclipses. And, Ms. Dallas, as humanity it gets to it discovers new things in space as new planets are discovered as they discover a greater working of how space operates does that fundamentally or could that fundamentally change how astrological charts are done if you have the presence of new declared planets new declared stars new yeah. declared galaxies well yes and no we, we have a rule, so to speak, in astrology that nothing comes to pass unless it's announced three times in the chart. In other words, you can't just say, oh, this means that. Otherwise, a computer could do it for you. So the themes of a chart are woven together, and it gives you lots of indicators. And But there are people who are only dealing with the Babylonian planets, only dealing with the Hellenistic. And there's been fantastic research on different planets that are called trans-Neptunian or trans-Pluto um, planets that are beyond Neptune, beyond Pluto. Uh, a woman wrote a book called There Are More Plutos, and it's incredible. Uh, her name is... Um, Susan Kinst, uh, if anybody's interested. But you have to know your astrology to read it. And, but uh, she's done fantastic research on placing these other planets within celebrities' charts or other people's charts to refine and, in some cases, unearth um, new uh, interpretations. So as the cosmos gets more complicated, there are more things to look at. Usually, they are indicated in some way in the basic chart. 
So you can spend your whole life spent, uh, studying astrology. I mean, I have and I do. And sometimes this little wheel gets so filled with planets and positions and fixed stars, you say, whoa, enough, enough. But um, people are complicated. Astrology is complicated. And I think as our consciousness and our, our, our and space and everything expand, there will be more messages coming to the people who are interpreting them from different sources. Absolutely. And it's us in the future, if a person is, you know, trans, if they're, they're born on Mars, or if they're, you know, obviously, I mean, the parents are from Earth, but if they're born on the moon or if they're born on another planet, how will that impact our astrological chart? I mean, how, does that open up an entirely new frontier for astrologers? to start mapping out these charts. Well, I guess it would. I mean, so far it hasn't happened. Um, I do suspect that some people are aliens, but they have earth births and earth charts, and their vibration level, however, is, is not quite human, whatever we describe. And that's not that they're worse or better, but it's, it's different. Okay. Is there some of the is there some signs that a person should, should look out for to see if they're an alien? Besides the whole, no, besides it's not the passionate uh, love for Reese's Pieces. What'd you say? Is there is there any other? What are some of the indications that somebody might be an alien besides being passionately in love with Reese's Pieces? Because I mean, <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that a reference be, that, for that ET. That would be the signature. That yeah. would be the signature. Um, well, obviously. People who we would say in English, um, you know, move to the beat of a different drummer. That usually their their family situation, how they got to Earth, is unique or even bizarre. Um, I remember a client telling me the story of being abandoned and kidnapped when he was an infant, and I mean abandoned by his by his birth mother, and then taken by another. I mean, it was it was a horrible story, and he suffered from it for most of his life. And I didn't work with him long enough to say, oh, yeah, he's an alien. And I would be very hesitant to tell somebody that. But sometimes people just feel so outside what is normally, or what is commonly, I should say, uh, society, that they... Um, identify with other and that could be interpreted as alien it's hard to say I mean I'm not an alien so I don't have that feeling but I believe there are people who are and they do have that feeling I don't know if I'm an alien or if I'm just a, a true aquarium because I don't feel at, at all one I don't feel anything similar to these people at all I mean I like the I like pizza I, I like my, my family. Oh, well, that, then you that, qualify. You qual- you're all right. You're so, not an yeah. alien. No, because there are some signs that, by nature, move to the beat of a different drummer. And numero uno is Aquarius. It's Aquarius, but, I mean, how, what's the difference? I mean, could, I, could I happen to be – what if I'm an alien? Would it happen to, happen to be an Aquarius? I mean, how's, how, do you know if you, how do you know if you're really an alien and not just based on your astrology? Well, you know, you can't kind of put in scientific measurement. I mean, you you can't go for a blood test and say, oh, yeah, you got kryptonite in your blood. I mean, that's the, the, the realm of fiction. But when we start to think about aliens and other worlds and other beings and other energies, let's put it that way, other energies, we are to a certain extent in the realm of um, imagination. Because as our imagination can expand, then we can conceive of different um, uh, worlds. And um, really the same laws or the same um, outreach goes for all beings. Kindness, love, respect, non-malevolence, fire is kind of scary. You know, these basic things. So I don't have a problem with there being other people on other planets. I don't believe that, that, you know, there's an entire planet that wants to destroy the Earth. We have a lot of lessons to learn, that's for sure. (laughs) If you're looking at collective humanity from an astrological perspective, 
is there, what do you see as some of the lessons that humanity has to learn right now, let's say for the next 20 years? Well, we are in the midst or on the verge of the beginning of the age of Aquarius. We talked a lot about Aquarius. And the age that we came from is the age of Pisces because it works backwards. So the next age after Aquarius will be Capricorn. The age of Pisces was identified as the age of the Piscean master, in other words, uh, Jesus Christ and the rise of Christianity, and a period of time, thousands of years, of faith, unthinking, un questioning faith and that and all of the monotheistic religions whether it's Muslim uh, Islam Christianity Judaism that posited one uh, one God were faith based and depended on the um, uh, belief in without being seen you know some people saw some miracles but you know, a lot of people didn't. And and so the, the, the feeling was faith. Well, that has gotten us this far, and we don't have that unthinking, uh, maybe even some people would say naive, childlike faith. We question. We are aware that there are countless different cultures and ways that people express themselves, and we have to hang together or we will fall apart um, because of, of uh, climate change, because of weapons, because of resources, because of war, all of those things. So uh, the Aquarian vibration is a group vibration of what is good for a wider group of people with a lot of uh, technology, questioning, and room for individual expression, so it's quite different. So this era, this age of Aquarian, do you think this will? Do you think this will actually mark the end of organized religion's dominance on the planet? Is this organized religion basically fulfill its purpose? And so, listen, we've we've had enough well, I think people. It, I think it. I think it's fading, and and um, I mean, there will always be those. Uh, I mean, for, uh, let's take Catholicism, which is kind of like the supreme um, image of organized religion, unbending, unyielding, um, and trying to do some good. Uh, I think it's pretty much passing away in the West. However, in Africa and in Asia uh, and South America, there's a resurgence. So in other words, it won't be a whole-scale thing. But there will be pockets of people that maintain, let's say, the old way, and then more and more people saying, it doesn't speak to me, I, I, I need something else. And we're in that divide right now. Ms. Dallas, in all of your years of reading charts and of doing what you're doing, are there any, have there any charts that have stuck out in your mind that really surprised you? I mean, have you ever read so much chart and said, you know, there's something so unusual about this chart, and you made you really ponder and wonder what their sole purpose was or what they were going to do, or if they, or if you knew instinctively, logically, that they were going to be somebody that was going to change the world? I personally have not had such a client because you know it's limited by the people who come to me. Um. But I have seen incredibly talented people and charts, and they go down the tubes, and that's a great waste of their energies. And I don't believe it was volitional. You know, they didn't choose that. It's just that the world and they didn't get along so well, and that's upsetting to me. And, for example, somebody is – kind of embracing their horoscope. They say, okay, well, I'm born under this sign. How do you maximize your astrological sign and take advantage of all of, uh, you know, the things that you have in your chart? I guess some people are resistant to who they are. I mean, how do you really take advantage of and say, well, look, because I'm an Aries, because I'm a Leo, because I'm a Virgo, 
I need to do this activity in this particular day of the year, or I should be doing this in this, that particular time. How do you really take full advantage of your chart and you know, kind of be in the best flow with it? You become an astro hero. Astro. You have to see my comic book, <laughs> which is basically twelve orphans that each have a different uh, astrological sign, and they become super astro heroes because of an eclipse and fight evil. But what you do is that you, as you come to know yourself, uh, and it's not like a presto bingo thing. I mean, for when a child is born from about zero to age seven, they're under the influence mostly of their moon sign, not their sun sign. Why are they under the so, influence of the moon sign? Well, because a child is an open receptacle to all sensation and habits and and feelings, you know. When the kid has a, a meltdown, he's not manifesting his personality. He's either hungry, wet, angry, uh, scared. You know, it's very basic. And then we grow into our personality as described by our sun sign. And then we go to school, and then our Mercury sign comes into play. And then we fall in love, and then we're dealing with Venus and Mars. And then we want some kind of spiritual outreach and also expanding into the world. And then we're doing Jupiter. And then we learn lessons, Saturn. And then the last three planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, are really outer planets that influence generations. So your chart is a lifelong uh, getting to know it. And in the same way that you said, oh, yeah, well, it just doesn't work anymore if I, if I stay out till 3 in the morning and, and shoot my nose up with cocaine, um, which could be indicated in the chart. I mean, this is a negative example. And so you say, well, that's not going to work anymore. I'm going to stop that. Okay, so you have um, encountered a hurdle from your chart and found the solution. Uh, and, Ms. Taz, right now we're in an incredible te technological age. And yeah. there's all this talk about artificial intelligence, robots. Mm -hmm. And I, it's kind of interesting. Like, we're at a point right now where I feel like the Terminator movies – were a, a beautiful warning saying, don't do this. Do not make self-aware robots. They will create nuclear war and blow everything up. And I feel like humans are like, no, you know, that's a great movie, but let's just do exactly what we're not supposed to do in those movies. And we have robots and technology that's becoming self-aware. If a technological robotic-based um, machine has a self-awareness and becomes consciousness, does that in entail that it does have an astrological chart? Can an astrological chart be could actually be predicted for a machine that does gain consciousness? What a thought. I had never thought about that. Uh, well, um, pets have astrological, ad, astrological charts. Companies. So I guess the answer would be yes, but um, because you could, you could say when was this uh, robot or this uh, self-aware artificial intelligence, when did it come off the assembly line, so to speak? Uh, and that would be, quote-unquote, its birth chart. But maybe I just don't know enough about artificial intelligence, but I don't care about it. I'll tell you why. Uh, because it, even though it might be self-aware and Siri can say things that sound human, the quality of human emotion does not seem to me to be duplicatable by a machine. In the same way that when they, everybody was getting crazy about the cloning thing, okay, they cloned this person, so statistically it was an exact copy, but they, uh, most of the cloned um, animals didn't have a long lifespan had certain genetic problems. I, I think in reality, artificial intelligence is is not our worry. <laughs> it's more worrisome that people, live people, are becoming clones and drones because they are f numbing themselves with uh, technology and 
Facebook and, and all sorts of social media that plug them into something that's artificial and gives them no real feeling. It's a fabricated feeling. You talked about astrological charts for pets, dogs, yeah. cats. I think, how do you do an astrological chart and an astrological chart for an animal? How is an astrological chart for an animal well, different than a, a, you know? a pet is born? You know, you know the day, you know the year, and sometimes people know the time. So uh, a chart is a mathematical construct of where all the planets were on the day, time, year, and place that an entity, we can put it that way, is born. So I do a lot of charts for people who travel, and they tell me when the plane is scheduled to leave from where uh, the day and the time. And I look at the chart, and I tell them, okay, fine, you can go, or maybe we should change this one. Haven't missed anybody yet, <laughs> which I'm happy about. So, you know, I'm curious, like, you know, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, you, have you, can you do a um, chart on my puppy? And then you do the chart, you say, you know what, this dog, it's going to um, it's gonna eat a lot of food. It's going to uh, it's going to drive you crazy. It's going to bark a lot. It's in a chart. Yeah, you can see when a, a a a pet is is extremely nervous, extremely high strung, what the health problems are, and then the relationship with the rest of the family. Now, I personally don't do a lot of pet charts because I'm, you know, animals are okay with me, but I'm not really in tune. My sister has five Jack Russells. Oh wow. Whoa. And um they all have very different personalities, but they're all Jack Russell. <laughs> so she she uh, um, had a, a pet boutique for a while, and she had um, uh, a pet psychic, because some people are very in tune with the vibrations of their pets, uh, giving advice for uh, training dogs, raising dogs, etc. And this 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 exists. And for problematic pets, it can be helpful. You know, dog whisperer, that whole thing. Those people are very much in tune with certain uh, breeds and certain animals. Oh, Miss Dallas, I had this question before, but mm. have you ever had an argument with your husband? You say, you know <laughs> what? Uh, I'm going to get him. And then you look at his chart and you wait until a certain period of time when, you know, when he won't be able to come back at you based on his chart. Anymore. Countless times. Really? Defensive astrology, essential. That's incredible. That's awesome. Because anybody dealing with another human being needs all the help they can get. <laughs> wow. And And it's not because, you know, my husband is more difficult than anybody else's, but uh, the, the, there are always better moments and worse moments. And why not choose the better? Sometimes you can't help it, you know, you just kind of <laughs> blow up. But uh, uh, I, I would be a fool if I didn't use my knowledge for that is my That's awesome. Own. I think people should you know, go to your website. I mean, remind everyone once again, your website is com. If you're going to have yeah. an argument with your spouse and you want to know the best day of the week to win the argument, make sure you go to Ms. Dallas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the same for asking for a raise at work. That's awesome. Or all sorts of small, mundane, but essential parts of life. Astrology can steer you. It may not be 100% right, but I know someone called me and said, look, I'm, I'm really getting tired of this job. I'm going to ask for a raise. I said, well, I don't think you're going to get it, and you'd look foolish, so you'd better wait. And I believe they did wait, uh, and, and I haven't heard the end of the story. But that is the kind of, of um, information that uh, an astrology chart and – you see, what you do is you don't take just the chart, but what's happening now in the heavens and how it affects you. Because everybody knows we have different chapters in our life. And sometimes we're swimming along and everything seems hunky-dory. And then other times you feel like you're putting, pushing the boulder up the mountain. And almost always those are coordinated with astrological transits. It was those, you're looking at astro astrology and you say, okay, well... Every year, the Earth goes around the sun, so there's one circle. Right. So we know that uh, you know every you're going, to, you're going to have things that are predictable as far as you know, days of the 
That's right. Predictable pattern going around. Is there any predictable pattern as far as the weeks go? And I'm asking you this because are there certain points in time during the week, astrologically speaking, that are good to engage in business decisions, that are good yes. to pursue romantic interests? So what would some of yes. those days uh, be? There are, there are two things to consider, and they basically, um, both of them, uh, have to do with the moon. Because all the planets move in regular patterns, and the moon, our closest neighbor, it's not really a planet, we call it a light, changes signs every two and a half days. So that's pretty quick. In addition, there is a tidal rhythm, there is an energy rhythm of the moon, which sailors know, fishermen know, farmers know, uh, hairdressers know, certain hair grows more quickly at certain phases of the moon. And that is the new moon to the full moon, which is the period that, of time we're in right now, uh, is the energetic rise of energy. It culminates at the full moon. You know, all those legends, howling at the moon, romance, all of those things are based in astrology. And then from the full moon to the dark of the moon is a decrease when the moon is waning in terms of energy. It doesn't mean we're all walking around, you know, exhausted, but it's not a time to initiate things. So that's one cycle, and that happens every month. So if you're opening up a business, if you're doing something new, whatever, you want to aim for the new moon to the full moon. Okay, now, see. the other thing is called moon void. Void doesn't mean that it falls out of the sky, but since the moon changes signs every two and a half days, there can be a period of time, and we are actually in one of those periods of time right now at 8.13 p.m. Eastern Time, when the moon is not connected to a major planet. So it's called void. And agreements, contracts, marriages, um, uh, job applications, tend not to hold during that period of time. So if somebody calls me and says, okay, I had a job interview last Thursday, I look at the phase of the moon and I see was the moon in, on course or void of course. If it were void of course, chances are they won't clinch the job. This could change. It's not an absolute. There are a few other things that I would look at, but as a rule of thumb. Now, anybody can find out this information. However, most people interpret it in a spooky way, like, oh, no, the moon's void. Of course, it can't do anything. Well, that's <laughs> stupid, you know. There are certain things that are not advised, but we can't be astro spooked. You know, I've had clients who call me, Ten times a day because they're spooked. And this is neurotic. <laughs> well, the work of retrograde I always t gets me sometimes. Yep. It gets me really, really bad at it. Um, yeah, that one is a confusing one. That's, it oh, is. It, is it, I wish there was a conscious being that could manifest into your humans so we could just punch its lights out because I think it really <laughs> I mean, you know what? I, I just come on. It's like it's like come on, everything's going fine. It's like you know what? I'm Mercury retrograde. I gotta slow everything down and mess up communications. Like you're an unwanted guest that no one invited to the party. Mercury retrograde. Well, I yeah. Stand that. And and this is the dilemma of of, of we humans because <sighs> there are forces over which we cannot control things. And learning the difference between what you, you can, you know, put your best effort into and when you got to glide seems to me to be one of the secrets of life. And astrology can help you navigate, but sometimes you just got to say, okay, I give up. That's it. <laughs> That's wow. it. Oh, goodness. Ms. Nelson, looking at the universe, you have got various planets, and apparently, you know, they're all kind of have a relationship to each other because of gravity. So there's push and pull with gravity. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that on a micro scale, you have people. People are skinny. Some people are overweight. If you are overweight or you are very skinny, does that have any impact on the intensity of where your chart is or where the phases of the moon are based on how much? Because mm. you, 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 I mean, if you're larger, you're retaining more mass and more water. And I'm wondering if that could be – that sensitivity – to your astrological chart to be impacted in any way? 
Mm, interesting. I, I would say sometimes you can see the tendency towards being overweight in a chart and also the tendency towards being very, very thin, kind of a nervous disposition. Um, not that all thin people are nervous. Uh, in ancient times, especially in the Middle Ages, most doctors were also astrologers or very aware of the relationship between at least the moon and a patient's healing. So I don't think it's a physical description of, you know, more mass, more sensitivity. It's not quite that um, overt. Um, but some people labor under the fact that they, they got fat charts, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, it would help if they ate well and exercised and everything, but they, they just may have a fat chart. Or the same same for people who just can't put weight on. Yeah, you people who can't put on weight, which is 0% of the population in the U.S. Yeah, no, that's no. true. <laughs> but, you know, we, we have a problem here with food. Because we have not valued um, kind of real food. It's been, you know, woof a sandwich down and, and get moving. It's not the way it is in the rest of the world. Well, we're going to do an interview with, um, hopefully going to do the interview with a, with a creator of a film called What the Health. A phenomenal documentary. It's on Netflix now. What the Health basically talks about the food industry. And <laughs> you get to the 49-minute mark and start shaking your head because you're going to realize that the American Health Association, the American uh, Heart Association, they're being paid off and getting money from the Indeed pharmaceutical companies. So well, you know, you're on time. your own, kid. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, you remember Super Size Me? Yep. Incredible. That guy is a Scorpio, and right. I happen to have a, a slight acquaintance with him, Morgan Spurlock. He's fantastic. We'd love to talk to him. Yeah. And, I mean, he really did risk his health making that documentary. Oh, my God. He goodness. felt horrible. <laughs> and, and his liver was in and. In my mind, only a Scorpio with these incredible powers of transformation could endure and also turn it into something that was so essential. It was an essential film. Okay. Um, so we're going to play a fun little game. And what I'll do is okay. I will give out a personality type, and I would like to know if you could possibly match that up with the uh, astrological Sunshine? sign. Sunshine? They resonate to you most. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not usually good at this, but I'll give it a whirl. All right, uh, let's get some music going, which I'll, I will add right back. So the first sign, what is the type of person that is most likely to be uh, falling in love every five seconds? Every other weekend they're falling in love. I'm in love with someone <laughs> new again. Oh, my God, this is the right one, but I don't know. You know, perpetually falling in love. There, okay, there would be two. First would be Libra, the sign of partnership. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second would be <coughs> a Cancerian, who basically um, not only falling in love, but is always looking for a home. So anybody that they can kind of connect with means they're in love, and that's a phone, uh, a home. Next person we have is the person that will bore anyone to death. The most boring person in the room. <laughs> uh, Virgo. Virgo. Virgo will, will bore because, anyone. Because their purpose in life <clears throat> is not to bore, but to be incredibly analytical about information. And so sometimes they get it in their head and they just go, 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 go. Okay. The next person we have is the person who is the overachiever, the person that must decide that they have to do everything, they have to accomplish everything, we must achieve, or life is not worth it. Who is the mm. overachiever? There's two. One would be Leo, um, but they really are not overachievers. They're achievers because that's the sign of the king. So they, they usually triumph. The other is Capricorn, the goat going up the mountain. And that's not as dramatic as the Leo, because it can take a lifetime. But Capricorn wants to get where it's going, must get where it's going, and works very hard to do that. 
Right? And I'm going to bring to your attention a type of personality that I think almost 100% of people on the planet do not like, even the people themselves, and that is the micromanager, the person who's got to oversee every little thing that you do. What types of micromanagers, what do you think, what chart would you like to associate with a micromanager? Um, it could be Aquarius in the phase of control. And then sometimes Aquarius would say, oh, I don't care. And it also... Um, well, I have to go back to Virgo because the, the micromanager is I- into the details. Let me think about that. Uh, Scorpio could do that, except when they get bored, they just say, screw it and leave. <laughs> All right. And what astrological charts, uh, astrological signs, are most likely to be most successful in love and romance? And what astrological signs are likely to be least successful? I think that Taurus can be very successful in love and romance because they're very stable and once they find something, no matter if it doesn't work a little bit or whatever, they stick to it and that's half the game. And it's a very uh, sensual sign and a very um, committed sign. Least likely is Sagittarius lacking staying power. They, they they don't feel the lack, but they're here, they're there. You know, they say, oh, look, that's interesting. Um, and and that lack of staying power um, eventually catches up with them. Now, what about the type of person that is very meticulous and has to do everything by the book? Well, you're talking, there's a variety of them. Um, Cancerians can be that way. Virgos can be that way. Um, Let's see, uh, Capricorn. I would say Capricorn because they believe fervently in a hierarchy and um, are basically at their core very conservative. So by the book is Capricorn. Okay. What about people who are considered to be uh, leaders, uh, you know, presidents, leaders, CEOs? Well, you'll be surprised. The most common sign for an American president is your sign, Aquarian. And, uh, and it's also weighted because FDR had four terms and he was an Aquarius. But we have Lincoln, FDR, Reagan, uh Polk, I think, or somebody, one of those guys that I can't remember, and I'm blanking out on the on the fifth one. Um, and the thing about Aquarian leaders is that they believe in group consensus as long as the group does what they want <laughs> that's to what do. They say. Yeah, that's what they say. Um, Right, so and the other leadership sign is um, uh, is Scorpio, but that is, let's say, maybe problematic because they don't lead overtly; they lead covertly. Um, Hillary Clinton is a Scorpio. She didn't make the grade, but you can see from her style she was not overt; she was quite covert. What about uh, somebody who's? Uh Predominantly a serial killer. Is there any astrological charts associated with serial oh, killers? Oh, I hate right? this question. I know. That's my I question. actually <laughs> exactly have why a I asked colleague. It. I like, oh, my no, God. I have like... a colleague <laughs> that is presenting this very summer his uh, um, uh, research on um, major crimes correlated to uh, astrological signs. I don't know what the answer is yet. And... and um, I think it's not it's not really true that you can say one sign or another sign um, because every sign has the potential for criminality in a particular way. Uh, and almost all the people who involve themselves in something heinous like serial killing uh, were, uh, and we don't forgive them, we still have to put them in prison, but they were victims of abuse themselves. And uh, abuse is equal opportunity. So can't give you one for that. Okay, what about somebody who's adventurous, who's got a natural tendency to explore, to take chances, to you know, kind of... Aries. Explore. Aries, okay. Aries, numero uno of the um, 
uh, of the zodiac because uh, Aries, you know, is kind of where angels fear, fear to tread. He leaps and then says, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But, you know, he's, he's going forward. Very, very adventuresome. What about an entertainer and a uh, you know, performer uh, of any kind? What do you see predominantly with that? Well, that's more specific. The general sign for entertainers are Leo because it's the sign of the dramatist. Um, singers many times are Taurus. Um, a lot of Scorpio performers. So um, a lot of Gemini. We haven't mentioned Gemini because they're, they're such good mimics. So it's kind of particular to the um, uh, type of entertainment. And Ms. Tells, what about you? What is your chart? If you when you did your chart, did you uh, print If I did it, yeah, I've done it. <laughs> you did your chart, but you did your chart. Were you surprised at where that you were an astrologer based on your chart when you did your chart? And it's like, oh my God, you're, I'm supposed to be an astrologer. I mean, was, there, was that something that you? Um, well, it caught up with me, and then I thought, oh yeah, look at that. Uh, I do have a classic signature of an astrologer, but. Uh, for me, it, it wasn't something that I knew I would be an astrologer. Some people have astrologers in their family, you know, and it's quite a, a common thing, and, and they grow up in that at, um, atmosphere. I, I did not. I thought I was going to be a star. I mean, in entertainment, I was in the theater and in the movies for for uh, the first chunk of my career. <laughs> and my last name is Stellis. It is my given name. And... Um, then astrology kind of took over, and I thought, well, I guess I am with the stars. I'm not a star, but uh, there's some kind of um, uh, coordination there. Yeah. Okay. And, Ms. Ellis, the question I have for you is, how have you changed in the past five years as far as the way you do charts, the way um, that you, you see the world, and where do you see yourself, your own evolution, occurring for the next 15, 20 years? What, what is your trajectory? Well, I would say in the last five years, as the tension level in the world has gotten higher, and that's happened really significantly in the last year, I, I, feel, I feel both more compassion for the people that I deal with and more impatience, <laughs> meaning that um, I'm often in the position of giving advice, and I never say, you got to do this, otherwise disaster will come. But sometimes I wonder, why are you asking me for my advice when you have no intention of following it? <laughs> and patience comes, uh, comes out in that regard. So at a certain point, you have to say, okay, the quote-unquote job is to offer the information, and then each soul can take up on it or not. The compassion comes in because I'm in an enviable position of, of um, listening to, to people's very innermost fears and concerns. I mean, sometimes it's like, oh, should I buy this sofa or not that sofa? Okay, that's okay. But when people say, well, what's my soul's purpose? Well, that's a big question. And I don't think that it's a casual question. And so I, I, I feel very fortunate to, not that I have, quote, unquote, the answer, but I, I can think I can, the chart can point them in other directions. Um, and for me, um, I'm very much interested now in uh, offering or creating this uh, series for kids about how they can come to know their own talents and abilities, becoming an astro hero, and save the world. So, so my trajectory is um, more writing, more books, and um, watching Tree of, Cre Tree of Keys grow. Miss Constance Stellis, the Astro Phenom, and our phenomenal Out of Limits of the Truth radio show, Virtue. To learn more about Ms. Constance Dulles and to get your chart done with Ms. Constance Dulles, please go to our website at ConstanceDulles.com. Ms. Dulles, great honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for all of your great contributions to the show. 
Uh, we love you so much. Thank you for being on our program today. Thank you, Ryan. Really, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Okay, everyone, that concludes today's edition of the Outer Limits of Minute Truth Radio Show. Special thanks to our treasured guest and virtue, Miss Constance Stellas. And special thanks, as always, to our other virtues, Miss Lisa Kaza and Miss Carrie O'Connor. To learn more about the Outer Limits of Minute Truth Radio Show, please go to our website at outerlimitsradio.com. Until the next time we meet, my friends, wishing upon you an abundance of peace, love, and fears. Take good care. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, this is Ryan, host and executive producer of the Out of Limits of Intertooth Radio Show. I've got some questions for you. So is that romantic relationship going to work out? Are you going to get that job you're seeking? Is the life that you're living right now going to turn out exactly the way you want it? Well, I don't have the answers to those questions. However, I know three amazing individuals that can probably shed some light on those very burning questions and other burning questions you may have. And those are the virtues. Miss Carrie O'Connor, CarrieO'Connor.com. Miss Lisa Kaza, Psychic Empath, at LisaKaza.com. And the Astro Phenom, Miss Constance Dellis, at ConstanceDellis.com. All three of these individuals are incredible, and all three can provide you the insight, guidance, and perspective you need to have a greater and more fulfilling life. I love these women. I love them so much. As a matter of fact, I'm encouraging you to call and reach out to them because not only are they three of the best uh, metaphysical teachers and seekers that I've ever come across, but out of sympathy because I drive them crazy. I constantly call them and ask them questions, and they got to hear my voice, and I feel so bad for them. And the reason why they tolerate me is because they want to they, they want to keep on going. They want to you know, be a part of the show and, and just keep on trucking along. But I know deep down inside, I, oh, the sound of my voice just drives them absolutely crazy. So the nicest thing you could do is to call them up, give them a break from hearing the sound of my voice, which cures insomnia on a dime, and ask them some questions. Ask them some questions about uh, your life and how they can be of assistance to you. All three are incredible. I highly recommend get a reading with all three. That is Psychic Medium, Ms. Carrie O'Connor at CarrieO'Connor.com. That is Psychic Empath, Ms. Lisa Casa at LisaCaza.com. And, of course, the Astro Phenom, Ms. Constance Dallas at ConstanceDallas.com. I'm Ryan McCormick with the Out of Limits of Intertooth Radio Show. Thank you so much for listening. Want to be heard or seen in front of millions of people? Want to be an expert on TV or radio? Goldman McCormick PR is a New York City-based public relations agency that specializes in traditional and social media placement for law, finance, media, and corporate-based clients. Goldman McCormick PR also are specialists in website development, radio show creation, press conferences, media training, and so much more. Check out GoldmanMcCormick.com for more information. GoldmanMcCormick.com. 